So thanks everybody for being here at our um, last event of the year that we are very happy to announce. Disrupt the system, not the climate. And I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the artistic director of the Disruption Network Club. And close to me, there is Lieke Plucher. Yeah, I'm Lieke Plucher. I'm directing the community program of the Disruption Network Lab. And so, so I want to thank our great uh, team, um, Nada Bakker, Monty Harmony, Jonas Franchi, and Giacomo Marin Salta. Thank you very much for the great work you did uh, this year and also to uh, reach this moment we are today. And um, so we just uh, want to do a little introduction uh, to express uh, uh, our joy of being here <laughs> after one year of work together and also tell you a bit what uh, happened in the past and what is going to happen in the future. And then we will introduce the first speakers. Uh, today we will have uh, with us the Digitale Freiheit and also Michael Kruichank that will also do a workshop. And at the end we have the fantastic band uh, System Absturz. I have to say I'm a Ooh. fan of them. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe the first fan. No, I always say that. <laughs> uh, but um, yes, so we go back uh, to what I was saying and uh, Lika will tell you a bit what happened before this yeah. year. So this is a pretty big slide with a lot of information. So I will speak shortly about what this is, but also there is some uh, some of these printouts everywhere around. So you can also take one of these prints for yourself because we have a lot of these infographs. But this is basically visualizing the whole year of Disruption Network Lab in 2019. So in the center, you see the four conferences we did this year. And today, uh, the final meetup we're doing is part of the meetup program, which we've been running throughout the year which is the big circle at the outside. So we've been running these meetups both before and after each conference to sort of connect with the Berlin-based initiatives and communities that are working on the same uh, same topics as the conferences. So today is kind of the, the grand finale, like the final meetup of this year, which you also see there all the way in the corner, disrupt the system, not the climate. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we were very happy to have this uh, community program throughout the, the year to connect more with the people in Berlin and also invite you to do other events around the conferences such as workshops and uh, extra talks and also even a performance today which we're really excited about. And we will be continuing in a similar kind of structure next year. So um, yeah, there will be the next meetup happening again next year before the first conference, which we will now briefly talk a bit more about. Yes, and just uh, to give you a little anticipation of what is going to happen next year, uh, we will start uh, our program uh, at the end of March. The first conference is uh, March 27 and 28. We are also planning a workshop on March 29, and the topic will be real estate, uh, property investment, and tax uh, avoidance connected with the housing uh, financial system. So we think that this topic was really important and is really important in the city of Berlin. And uh, we want to uh, keep working together with Transparency International and uh, trying also in that sense to expose uh, misconducts, uh, wrongdoing, uh, and uh, uh, system of injustice. That was a bit the motto we created this year, also uh, imagining our series, uh, The Art of Exposing Injustice, that was the topic uh, of the whole year conference program. And uh, instead, uh, next year we start uh, the series that will be actually four years. Uh, it's called Tactics of Empowerment. And uh, as I say, the first uh, uh, will be related to the real estate uh, business. The second conference will be May 15 and 16. And it's uh, related to the topic of refugee migration and also border controls uh, and the stigmatization of uh, refugees in the light of right-wing uh, extremism and propaganda. So we also reconnect with the topics we analyzed in 2018. And so we also saw it was really important to cover this issue. And uh, in September 25th and 26th, uh, we will then uh, create another conference uh, that uh, also goes back uh, to the analysis we did this year about uh, AI. Uh, but this time we will analyze the topic of smart cities uh, and also cities of the future and the discourse of surveillance and uh, human rights connected to the subject. 
and I'm going to uh, curate this conference together with an investigative journalist uh, from Italy that is called uh, Mauro Mondello, and we have been doing already a conference together, if people remember, in 2017, uh, that was about uh, the media propaganda of ISIS. And uh, then, uh, in September, we will have uh, another community conference. Yeah, so no, sorry, in November. November, yeah, the end of the year. So I showed before this whole circle of meetups. So this we will do also in 2020, and the whole uh, meetup program culminates in this final community conference where we look back at these three topics but more from the community angle. So we also feature workshops and we involve local communities working in these fields. So that will be at the end of November next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also to thank for the next year program, the Senatsverwaltung für Kultur in Europa, because it's thanks to them that we finally got uh, um, furthering uh, 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 funding uh, of four years. So we know that the Disruption Network Club for sure will go on until 2023, and of course uh, longer in our hearts. Yeah. <laughs> and then before I hand yeah. over to you to introduce the program of today, we also really want to thank our funders of 2019. So these are the people that supported our community program for the first year. And this is the Guerrilla Foundation and also the Reimagine Europe project, which has been funding us since September. So big thanks to them and hand over to you to introduce mm -hmm. the event of today. Yes, so uh, we will start with the talk of Digitale Freiheit. So I call them here on stage. Please come. Where are they? Yes, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just introduce them briefly. First, let's clap. Yeah. Uh, so the Digitale Freiheit was founded in the summer of 2017 is a group committed to fight uh, with colorful and loud action, mass surveillance, and advocate for more privacy. I really like your <laughs> definition. Uh, they want uh, awareness about the impact of surveillance, and they do this with political actions such as uh, flash mobs, uh, protests, uh, workshops, moving eyes, or parties that we will have also later. Uh, so now I give uh, the microphone to you and I come back uh, for the question and answer. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you so much for the warm welcome. We're super thrilled to be here and to talk to you about Digitale Freiheit, which means digital freedom in German. Um, so who are we? Uh, we're not only Victor and I, we're like a whole bunch of young people who care about privacy and who would like to raise awareness on this topic. Um, we would like to raise awareness actually in the broader public. So there's a lot of expert dialogue already going on we try to actually reach people who haven't thought much about some of the very um, abstract concepts of privacy, why is privacy important for a healthy democracy. So we try to take these complex topics and make them visual in a way, um, maybe raise emotions on these maybe like dry topics and try to break difficult topics down to very easy images. So we will present to you some of the things we've done, some of our actions as we call them. The first one will um, have to do with this train station that you see here, the Berlin Zitkreuz. Can you see the pictures well or are we sitting in front of them? <laughs> okay, great. Um, maybe you also. So yeah, perhaps you already know this, it's um, a Berlin railway station, and why are we talking about this? What happened there? So in the summer of 2017, um, there was a new joint project of German Railway, so Deutsche Bahn, the Federal Police, uh, Ministry of Interior, and some other stakeholders, and they had the following plan. They wanted to test at this railway station if systems of facial recognition work well. So it would work well at this train station and 
you know, for maybe deploying them in other train stations. We don't know what for, but they wanted to see if these technologies work well. So how did they do that? Um, they asked people if they wanted to participate in this test and they gave them Amazon coupons if they wanted to participate. And then, so you would sign up and get your photo taken, biometric measures, and then you would get into their database. And then every time you walk through this train station, you will be scanned. And hopefully if the technology works well, your face will match with the database and the technology will have recognized your face. So this also meant that people who didn't participate in the project were also scanned in the areas that were marked as areas of testing this facial recognition methods. Now we will show you what we, how we try to raise awareness about this. Okay. Um, so what we usually do is try to um, do actions that work in one picture. So where you can take one picture and can show one picture and uh, t tell the whole story or like not like tell the story but make it possible to understand what what issue we want to like work on or like what we wanted to show. And uh, what we did on Südkreuz were uh, multiple actions when one looked like this. Um, I think this image is really full, but uh, we still try to like uh, show show what's going on. Um, so uh, this, this consisted of a, we called it a surveillance lane. So um, on the bottom of an escalator, but I will show you that in a minute. Uh, there we had a banner saying keine Angst, wir schauen nur in German, which means uh, no worries, we're just watching. Um, and so, so the, that was the perspective for like getting the whole story in one picture. Uh, but what, what it was actually about was the, the surveillance lane. So it looked like this. Um, and it was on the bottom of an escalator. So um, at the Südkreuz station there were different areas and some areas were tested with facial recognition systems. Uh, and when you walked through that area, when you moved through that area, you were automatically agreeing to have your picture taken and being fed into the uh, facial recognition test system and uh, being matched with the pictures of the other participants of that trial. Um, and what we wanted to show is that when you move through that section of the train station, uh, you already agree to have people watch you and analyze you. Uh, and if it's, if it's just a camera, you, you usually don't see that, you don't realize that what's happening. Uh, but what we wanted to show is that maybe to many people it feels uncomfortable to be watched, to be analyzed. Um, and, and what we did to that with that was uh, build the, the analog, the human equivalent of a system that's watching you all the time without having any choice, because you had the choice not to the use the escalator. So that was the, the test setup. If you didn't use the escalator and walked down the stairs yourself, um, then you weren't um, analyzed. But if you used the escalator, you, you moved through the zone with the facial recognition system, the, so you automatically were analyzed and recognized and being fed in that into that system. So what happened here? Um, if you walked down that escalator, um, there was this like two rows of people standing there, mostly dressed in black, wearing sunglasses, um, and you had no other option but to go there because you had, you had already chosen to take the escalator. Um, and they didn't do anything. They had like uh, blank faces, uh, but they followed you with their heads. So while you walked through there, you got the feedback, somebody's watching me, but you don't know what they're taking of you. They, they, you don't, don't know what they think, if they think you're suspicious or not. Um, you just know I'm being watched. Shit, what is this? What's happening? Um, and I think that was, that was interesting to take that into the real world and show people what was actually happening uh, when it's not hidden beneath the like small shiny cameras. And the reactions of the people were really interesting. So many people came to us and were like, what are you doing? What is this? What is happening? And then we explained to them, yeah, this, this uh, facial recognition test. Many had no idea. Al although there were like big signs, you can see it here on the floor, there were big signs on the train station saying, if you walk through this line, you agree to like taking uh, part in that uh, test case and your pictures are going to be taken. 
attention facial recognition system, but still many people had no idea. Uh, and, and many people came to us and were like, hey, this is such a good idea and thanks, um, it's great what you're doing. Others were really annoyed and really angry with us, I think. Um, or it, it came to really socially awkward situations because people were standing there and felt, uh, I think, really unwell, really intimidated because they have like so many people just watching you with blank faces, you don't know what's happening. They're like absolutely they're stronger than you. They're in the majority. They're like, you're, you're just like alone in, in um, opposing these people. Um, so yeah, that was fun. Um, <laughs> another thing we did was uh, in, in this um, a strategy to, to take pictures that work in like only viewing one thing and getting getting the story was this. Um, this, uh, yeah, I realize many of you are not going to speak German, so we, we translated there. Um, uh, this was uh, another, another try at uh, telling the picture of uh, the, the story of uh, uh, many people saying I have nothing to hide. So we wanted to search for things that maybe people do have to hide, although they're not really aware of that. And, and like make people ask themselves, do I really not have anything to hide? Uh, and, and because of that, for that, we searched for things that we think many people do or like stuff that is uh, applying to many people um, and they're maybe not aware that they have something that's like in front of some people not really okay. For example, I don't know, being awake for 72 hours, uh, going to demonstrations, uh, watching porn. Um, yeah, maybe you, you don't want in, in a job interview. You have to ask yourself if you want other people to know that. Um, yeah, another thing we did for that um, at, uh, at that train station um, was uh, trying to, to generate pictures that work as symbolic pictures, so like as pictures uh, kind of guiding that story or to, to be used for, for media outlets to tell that story. Um, so we uh, tried around uh, with that uh, camera head. So we built it with, I think, from old cardboard. Like if you're moving around, uh, like these cardboard boxes, um, and uh, I think it worked pretty well. So kind of many media outlets used that picture. I think both in Germany and I don't know where in the US, somewhere. Yes, um, on the international level, for example, in Brussels, political, punk Brussels. And Some. Um, yeah, and that was fun. Um, it was always also fun to walk around with that and like um, confront people and just like act normal or give people flyers. Um, many people were law things, some people didn't understand what we're, <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that's really nice to like, again, take the, the, the situation that's like happening abstractly on a technical level to the, the real physical world and make it uh, like feelable or like, because I think at least some people feel being watched if you have a big camera staring at you. Uh, and, and the guy wearing it is, I think, 10 centimeters taller than me, so he's really tall. <laughs> and there's this big camera watching you. Uh, yeah, so that was fun. Um, another, another short story, uh, funny story about that protest was um, we did it with some other groups. Um, and because it was a train station, there were some security re regulations for the protest. So there was this rule we weren't allowed to use any electronically amplified uh, speaker systems. We could in an emergency, maybe you would not hear the emergency uh, uh, messages from the train station. Um, but uh, some people had the nice idea to get around that and to still be allowed by inviting a band. <laughs> and that worked actually because uh, it was not electronically amplified um, and we had a lot of fun and we're dancing and <laughs> brought that to the train station as well. Yeah, with that. Thank you. So you might ask yourself, was this everything that happened at train station Südkreuz or was there more? Yes, there was more. So the facial recognition phase was only the first phase of the project. There was a second phase which started this year and was also um, concluded this year. 
Um, so this phase was actually about behavior recognition. So the plan of the stakeholders that I mentioned were also participating in the first phase was that they wanted to see certain behavior, they wanted to automatically recognize it and in order for it to um, cause an alarm or something and people look further into it. So this behavior could be a person lying on the ground, um, whether they would be sleeping, maybe a homeless person, or whether they would be injured, we, that doesn't, the system doesn't know that obviously. But also other scenarios like a person um, walks away from a suitcase or many people running into the same direction. This kind of behavior, they would like to recognize it with, um, yeah, with technology. So this was what the second phase was about. And um, well, the first phase of facial recognition actually caused a lot of negative feedback because the results weren't very good and there were also many privacy concerns raised by many different players. So for that reason, the, um, the stakeholders tr decided to postpone the second phase. It was supposed to start in February this year and we never heard about it again. And then suddenly it came in the press in the autumn, in autumn. And we read about it right when it came up, but that was about four days before it would start. So we were thinking, this is very spontaneous, but we would still like to do something. How can we raise awareness on this? How can we visualize this? And um, we did something kind of similar to the first project. So um, our member here is holding a sign saying, Stasi Dream Südkreuz. So, um, as you probably know, Stasi was the secret um, service in the German Democratic Republic, very um, invasive and spying on the whole population. And we're, well, the person holding this is trying to say the Südkreuz would have been a dream for the Stasi. We were also wearing all black clothes with white stripes on it, symbolizing skeletons. So the notion that if cameras with intelligent technology behind them scan you, you will be scanned to your bones. This is what's the meaning of those um, signs. So Stasi Dream Südkreuz, nothing to hide, take off your pants and stop Südkreuz project. And what's also um, an interesting uh, little story about this is that we were a bit worried if what we were doing was legal because um, regarding protest law, you're not allowed to wear a uniform um, at a protest as a group. You could see that this might be a uniform what we're wearing and you're also not allowed to fully cover your head. And if you look back at this, then I would say they fully covered their head. <laughs> so we asked um, the police officer in charge, where we also registered our protest, if this was okay. And his answer was that it's not even, it's not only legal in this case, he thinks it's actually necessary to get our message across. <laughs> So here's another um, one of our action, I think a very fun one. Um, it was regarding a new idea from the Ministry of Interior. They were um, thinking about messengers and the end-to-end -end encryption. And if it wasn't possible to weaken this encryption in order to read messages, messages in clear text from some individuals that they would like to target. Um, here's what we did in order to symbolize that. Okay, so um, again, as with the Südkreuz thing, we asked ourselves where is this coming from? Well, the Ministry of Interior. So that was the place where we're going to be. Uh, and then we asked ourselves, so what what's actually happening? So people are introducing uh, weaknesses into into the protection, into into encryption protections of messengers, so the effect of that is that it's easier to, to basically break your privacy. So like 
to get access to your data, to your communications, uh, which kind of strips away your protective layers of privacy that you as a citizen need to act on yourself. Uh, and yeah, what, like b building a picture from that, what we came up with is this, <laughs> um, which is uh, right in front of the Ministry of Interior. Um, and yeah, it was really cold. Maybe you can see it on the next that they're kind of red. Um, and yeah, so we, we tried to, to get this notion of like, uh, potentially you're stripped away with your pants and stand there half naked in the public. Um, funny story with that is that um, actually like we had um, our official protest was registered on the on the middle of the street in, in front of the Ministry of Interior. Um, but we thought, hey, maybe it's nice to go like directly in front of that logo to have like a, a more direct picture with, with the name of the ministry. Uh, so we asked at the entrance, hey, can we take some pictures in front of your, in front of your logo? And they were, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's public space. Go for it. Um, but then we started taking our pants off. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it took one and a half minutes or so <laughs> until somebody came out and was like, what are you doing? Go away. There's your place. <laughs> so then we went here, which was our <laughs> official place. <laughs> um, yeah, where we uh, played around uh, with more, like, uh, more people. Um, uh, we played also around with signs. So the sign means privacy in German. Uh, and we, we try to capture this concept of like your privacy being like stripped away its clothes uh, or with multiple people. These are basically fundamental rights that are like touched by backdoors, by uh, uh, purposely uh, weakened encryption. Uh, so yeah, the privacy of correspondence, your privacy, your presumption of innocence and your freedom of speech kind of don't look as well anymore as they did before, if you introduce such uh, weaknesses, such as backdoors. Uh, and, and with all these um, like material that we had, we then made a, a campaigning picture, uh, trying to like get this notion across of like, if you pull down some pants, you pull down all pants potentially, uh, and maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah. The next one is about a debate that you're probably all very familiar with. Um, it's the copyright reform on the EU level, um, more specifically the new copyright directive and its former Article 13. Okay, so um, this, wha what we did here was uh, between the actual, like, there was this um, election within the European Parliament where the European Parliament agreed to like take that uh, copyright re, um, reform and uh, the actual European election, because we thought after that process of the European Parliament agreeing to uh, the uh, the reform, maybe it's like a nice situation to like refresh in the minds of like refresh that thing that happened and uh, because. Um, the uh, Christian Democratic Party was the only party that completely voted before that reform. We thought, yeah, well, maybe that's a good place. Um, and then we painted a big banner uh, and, and uh, placed that there, which was 20 times 3 meters. So you can see Mirko really fighting, holding that, <laughs> really struggling against the wind because we didn't realize a really big banner is actually a sail. So it was a bit windy. <laughs> And later in the process, it, it was uh, destroyed by the wind because it, it was the forces were just too strong. Um, yeah, to uh, to that, that was our that were our past projects. Um, to the future, we're still working on official recognition because we think that's really important, and there's still a lot of stuff happening. Um, uh, there, there are plans uh, by the Ministry of Interior and the Deutsche Bahn to like roll out facial recognition systems to potentially many trail, uh, train stations. And because in the past we uh, basically always did uh, like reactive actions. So we kind of like somebody c 
came with some proposal and we reacted by uh, taking pictures and making projects. And this time, for the first time, basically, we're trying to, to do something proactive. So we're, we're building a website, kind of like a, a petition. Or um, So f for the first part, it's, it's going to be a position, kind of, kind of like a campaigning website where we formulate the position that facial recognition, like mass, like facial recognition on a massive scale doesn't belong in the public space and we think that it's dangerous uh, and we're working with other organizations to build a big uh, community of organizations like being uh, behind that uh, position that this uh, is not a good idea for a democracy to build that and uh, in, in a second stage uh, it will be like we will write a petition and then like everybody can sign it uh, to to we don't think what that we can like like immediately stop all facial recognition projects, but maybe at least we can uh, it establish the position that there are some people, some organizations, some established organizations in Germany that actually think it's not a good idea to roll out fa facial recognition to everywhere. So that's it, basically. Thanks. Hello, yes. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for the presentation that you just gave. Um, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I know that only we have only 15 minutes, so I try to only ask two questions. And the first is a bit uh, um, investigative, because uh, I am actually curious of what is the process uh, underneath your actions because uh, I think that for you the important moment is really the moment in which you are uh, visible and you give a message but it's also sometimes interesting to understand how the thing uh, start and uh, so I would be also curious for example in the case of the um, action in Sudkreuz uh, how do you build up uh, your own uh, action do you also speak with journalists or with policy makers uh, uh, or is uh, something that you do very spontaneously. I think it's also important to understand uh, uh, how you manage to deliver your message, because then, of course, we know that uh, all this kind of relationship behind the action are often also important for the result of uh, them. So if we want to take one example, or maybe you have other examples that are uh, uh, good to discuss, also, for example, interesting, how did you create this group? I mean, you are a group of people. I mean, just a bit the background. Okay, um, so first for the background, um, it was basically, I think in the beginning, four people who just had the same situation that they like had been searching for a group in Berlin, like doing politics stuff on the topic of maybe surveillance is not so good uh, after all. Um, and we were actually kind of like, uh, so, so some of us were first in the Amnesty International group of our university. Um, and then at some point, the people at the Amnesty International group didn't want to work on surveillance anymore. And they went, oh, we're bored of that topic. <laughs> and we were like, no, this is really interesting. <laughs> so uh, like a small part of that Amnesty International group started like splitting to another group and uh, then we found more and more people who also were interested uh, to work on that topic and um, I think from the beginning our motivation was kind of to have a group open for everybody without any need for technical expertise. So there, um, in, in our experience there were many groups in Berlin 
what was really easy to get into, they were kind of like focused around the, the technical side, so for example, Crypto Party, um, and uh, we, we think that's really important, but we kind of like, we had the urge to do something like not working on technology, but more like on the impacts of that on the society. Um, yeah, and that's kind of how we came together. Um, yeah, and for how... Sorry, might I add something to that? Yes, sure. sure. Um, yes, you were saying that you don't need any background in technology, and that's what I would like to add on. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, because actually, yeah, some of us are do IT, but not all of us. So there are people um, who are in sociology or in journalism or in law. So um, yeah, very broad background. And that's also what's nice because when we have projects, um, there's someone who's good at something always. So we have the difficult different expertise for the different areas, which is really nice. And yes, it's a very open group. I can say that um, I came there later and there's like a very there's no hierarchy. There's, it's like very flat, you can just join in. And about the process? Okay, uh, so f is it the process. Um, usually we're pretty spontaneous. I think that's kind of what, what we can deliver. Like I think our part in that whole game is that we like, um, we have people who have free time during the day sometimes. So there were like, I think a situation where some law was passed and I think eight hours after that or 10 hours after that, we had a really small protest in front of a building. So maybe uh, sometimes we're really fast uh, doing that. Um, I think uh, at the second stage of the behavioral recognition systems, I think we had four days or something between meeting up and saying, hey, shit, this is starting. Maybe we should do something. Can we do something? Wait, yes, we can. <laughs> we have some uh, science and some stuff. Uh, maybe we can improvise and build something out of that. So I think, um, a lot of that stuff is really uh, like we we uh, yeah it's so so because I think y often it's really important to to get like something quick, and it's better to have something not completely perfect quick than something well really elaborated but months later. Um, so usually it's just uh, we look all around. Do we have enough people to do it? And uh, if we find enough people, we just do it. And so specifically speaking about the action in Sudkreuz, uh, I was curious because you also say that uh, they didn't build up the second phase after your action. So you also had some concrete impact there. You managed to do a change. Well, we would hope so. Uh, many people were involved in that, in the protests. Um, I would say that the negative feedback was very visible in the media. And um, we spoke to people who spoke to um, the stakeholders and they said that they actually weren't very happy with the negative feedback. Um, some stakeholders might also not be happy with the whole process at all. And um, therefore, yes, they were postponing it. Um, and yeah, uh, so I think all of this is perhaps not too transparent. Like it's kind of hard to tell sometimes what your impact really was. But for me, if I see one of our pictures used in the newspapers, I think we've done our job because it's so difficult to visualize mass surveillance, for example. And it's nice if pictures, or we give newspapers pictures that they can use if they wanna write something about that. But uh, instead, the people also, you say there was ambivalence, feedback, some were interested, other felt uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, in, uh, invaded in their privacy. That I find it like a kind of paradox because you were really doing action to protect the privacy and they felt uh, somehow attacked by you. Uh, how did it work with the people there? I mean, usually, I think all the topics of mass surveillance really fall like off the agenda usually. So although it's happening, really many people don't know anything about it. Usually with these projects, with these like uh, advances, um, yeah, there was kind of paradox, but I think they didn't, 
I think they were more uncomfortable on a social level and not on a political level. So nobody was saying, hey, why are you protesting against this project? And why are you protecting my privacy? Uh, but they were more like with the actual social situation with uh, 20 people standing around them, staring at them without ha having like any easy exit from that situation. Uh, yeah, that's uh, and I, I completely uh, like I can empathize with feeling uncomfortable in that situation, but I think it's kind of necessary or it should be allowed to visualize it that way because it's happening anyways. And uh, yeah. Now I would open to you if you have questions. Yes. Just a moment, because we are recording, so please use the mic. So I have a question about the, the, the copyright issues, which most people think this is kind of a, a clear situation. Nobody wants upload filters. We all want to be able to share information on the web. But there's, there's something a lot more complicated with copyright issues, and I'm curious to ask you if, if you've thought about this angle. Um, some friends of mine uh, are in a band, an activist band, and they, uh, their, their, their music is, is on YouTube. And uh, some of the members are Muslim in this band. And because nobody's really able to control what a, a corporation like YouTube is doing with this information, uh, there is advertising before you watch this this musicians uh, these musicians' music, and it's for a a pro-Israel um, uh, anti-BDS uh, advertisement, and it's like the artist has no control because we've lost sort of the rights as artists to to stop these giant companies from making money off of our art. So I'm just wondering, like, is there some way that you've thought about in terms of like reeling in the power of the corporations, but still keeping the rights of us to exchange the music that we want to exchange with each other? So the co in other words, the copyright issue, I think, needs to be revisited because otherwise we lose power to the, the tech titans who will profit from everything we do and we get so little. Yes, I would just like to um, answer directly to your questions if we've also seen this topic from other angles. For me, it's certainly the case because um, I learned about um, IP law, intellectual property at, at the university. Um, I know why there exists a copyright and I've also worked in the area so I kind of also understand where people who have a copyright come from, and it's also important. Um, what we were thinking with criticizing the upload filters was especially the privacy part. So that if upload filters will become necessary in order to implement the law, then more internet traffic than before will go through the big players, the big internet companies which is bad for privacy. Um, and so, yes, we tried to like focus on our core topic, which is privacy, in criticizing that. Nevertheless, um, I totally agree that there needs to be a good you know, way to get all of the different <laughs> rights of people um, into a good balance, but probably another way. Another question from the audience. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding how do you do outreach with the people there during the action? Um, <coughs> and I mean, you in the action in Sudkreis in particular, you were engaging a lot with the people there. Um, but this is something, if you do a performance, um, it's sometimes hard for people to understand what you're trying to convey without saying it explicitly. 
um, although someone who knows a little bit about what you are trying to say might understand, but as you say, many people don't even know what's happening. Um, <coughs> so you mentioned something about flyers, but I'm curious, like, um, like do you prepare flyers beforehand? Do you prepare a, a, some kind of script to tell to the people? Um, <coughs> sorry, and if I may ask, I may ask a second one, is if you focus more on like outreach there in during the action or more on social media or what's the balance between those, those two things? Um, yeah, so usually we're really pragmatic about that. So the situation with the Zitkreuz pictures I showed to you, that was with other organizations and the flyers were not from us. Uh, so usually we really focus on the pictures and the media material like resulting from the situation. Um, because if you think about it in numbers, it's like, 20 people walking by or 30 depending on where you are and how long you are there and it's really not effective to, to, to focus on them so usually it's just only for the pictures and the videos does that answer your question yeah we have still some time for two questions yes also some female voice until now only men ask Hi. Uh, in the beginning, you said that there was no clear explanation for why there was surveillance in Zutkreuz. So I would like to ask if there is any excuse or reason, terrorism or against left-wing demonstrations that we know that police normally film demonstrations here in Germany, in Berlin. So I'm curious if you have any other information about What's the reason the government or these institutions are doing the mass surveillance, video surveillance in Zutkreuz and they want in other stations? I'm pretty sure that the um, initiative to start that project was um, kind of sometime after the terror attack here in Berlin. So I think there was this, uh, the spring and summer of 2017, where lots of surveillance laws and laws limiting uh, the, the right to privacy was, uh, were introduced. And so I think it had like this, this narrative of terrorism all over it. Um, and kind of in the process, if you, if you looked at what, what are they actually testing? So uh, with the facial recognition system, they were testing finding people that they know. That's something that's, maybe useful for terrorism but still if you cover your face if you know that you're wanted and searched for it doesn't work anymore but interesting was that in the behavioral recognition test phase it wasn't so relevant to terrorism anymore so it was more like how many people are on that platform and is somebody like helplessly on the floor of course there was this typical are there any like lost um, pieces of baggage luggage um but um, yeah, so the, the overall narrative was uh, terrorism, but I think the times have kind of changed. And I think recently there was, were more like uh, uh, quasi uh, uh, proposals for more uh, pr um, surveillance measures in Germany. And now it's right-wing terrorism because now uh, right-wing terrorism is the new thing. And it, but it used to be when that was introduced, it used to be Islamic terrorism, the narrative. Now we have time for the last question. No question? Yes. The microphone. I guess beneath all of this would be data mining, no? It's like there someone wants to mine the data because this is valuable, you know, from from the people's faces. So where in what situation with the surveillance yes um like who do you know if there's people behind this trying to get this data to sell this data obviously because i guess this is the value of of the the uh, technology at the end of the day and what is what, what has value past the terrorism thing you know yeah so do you want to or me um there was um the uh, the um the police and the, the, the stakeholders in initiating the project were cooperating with some vendors of facial recognition software. Um, they are known and, and they were testing specifically some, I think five or three different software versions. They were able to um, uh, 
recognize these systems. Um, as much as we are aware, there were no like spillover or like people selling the data. But I think it was really limited to the to the police conducting these tests. Um, and I don't even know if the vendors of the facial recognition software got the faces, the actual pictures of the faces to train their algorithms to, to perform better. I think it was just that they wanted to use already existing finished products and see which is performing how well. Uh, so there was no back and forth with data as far as we know. So uh, um, I wanted to say that I really like also your approach because you are uh, analyzing topics that in a sense are very serious and uh, um, also technical but you do it uh, with humor and irony at the same time and I think this is something that is not easy to find in groups that work in our environment. So I think what you do is also very important in the term of uh, uh, kind of a conceptual aesthetic that you have. Uh, I find it uh, really great. Um, and I wanted just to say, how is possible to support you? D do you take donation, for example? How can <laughs> we do for uh, supporting you? So we do take donations. There's a small box um, by the bar. It's almost Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> But you could also contribute in many other ways. So um, yeah, in case you're interested in getting in touch, you can do that here. Or, um, well, we also have Facebook. We don't really use it much. But in case that's your favorite platform, there's a way to connect. And we will also set up an Instagram um, account because I think it would really work well with our pictures. Obviously, our internal communication doesn't go through these um, you know, providers. But yes, we use it to reach the people where they are. Um, that's something you could do. You could also just stop by if you like. Um, we actually meet every Thursday in the evening. And yes, it's just like very, you know, you don't have to uh, uh, take any task or anything. Just you can just stop by, like, uh, I don't know, have a beer or something or discuss stuff with us. Um, Where do you meet? Yes, we meet at uh, the Technical University of Berlin. Um, and we have a very detailed description of how you get to the room on our website. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we're always happy about new faces. Um, you can also see us at some other um, events, which we also will um, tell you about on the website. And yes, if you have any questions also during tonight, you can always come to us. We're happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. And we will see a part of you coming back on stage this night for our party, so stay until the end. And now we do a little break, uh, and uh, then we will have with us uh, Michael Kruitschank for uh, his talk and workshop about open source intelligence and the climate change and political conflict, so please stay. And thank you very much again.